Hello everyone, my name is Zach, and now that we've gone over an introduction, the guts, the physics behind performance, and design for performance, it's time to talk about how designs fail, and the limits which define functional design. A design can be functional if and only if it is designed to exist in a state which is within its limits. This design criteria is known as limit state design. In this video, we will go over what limit state design is, how to adequately practice it, and how to design a yo-yo that your manufacturer will not shriek away from in abject terror. First off, what is limit state design really? Limit state design is a term that was almost exclusively used by Soviet structural engineers to refer to the act of designing around a list of specific limiting criteria. However, while it is intended to be used for bridges constructed by prisoners out of extremely low-grade building materials, I find it the best turn of phrase to describe the finer aspects of yo-yo design. In a way, I've already been using its basic principles in my previous videos. We designed our test yo-yo in a box to limit its physical dimensions to the desired dimensions, and we designed our yo-yo geometry to meet specific limits in terms of its mass properties. But there are a plethora of other limits which must be taken into account in order to have a functional design. And those limits in final product performance and manufacturing are the following. I'll, uh, I will go through them in a three-part list. Part 1. What is the minimum wall thickness? Is a question that I see asked very frequently, and I even touched on it with an easy rule of thumb for specific 6061 aluminum yo-yos in an earlier video. But this simple and straightforward answer is not the full story, for 6061 or for any other material yo-yo. There are two factors that must be taken into account when selecting a minimum wall thickness limit for your yo-yo. Those two factors are structural integrity and machinability. On the topic of structural integrity, it is a common expectation of throwers the world over that their yo-yos will not shatter irreparably when they inevitably contact the ground by mistake. So as a designer, you must compensate for this. The trouble occurs when you realize that the design imperative to maximize rim weight would have a design which violated the wall thickness limit, hence the correlation between rim weightedness and structural weakness. Except the opposite of this is also true. A yo-yo which compensates too much for structural failure near the response will inevitably exhibit great frailty at its rims. This is why the subject of rim weightedness versus strength is quite complicated. Both edge cases exhibit failure, meaning that you cannot truly optimize both of them in a single design, nor can you definitively say that one yo-yo will be weaker than another yo-yo, purely by its minimum wall thickness. Hence why a uniform wall thickness criteria can at first seem so reasonable a solution. However, it is still a very conservative assumption, as the forces a yo-yo will undergo are really a function of a yo-yo's geometry. For example, a yo-yo like this one may technically never have a wall thickness that violates our pre-stated conservative limits, but I can say with near certainty that if a yo-yo like this hit the ground with a significant impulse, the large moment created by the high width would put an extremely large force on the bearing seat, which would only grow larger in magnitude as either the width of the effective catch zone increased or the average radius of the bearing area decreased. This is one reason why yo-yos with smaller bearings ought not exist with higher width to diameter ratios. On to the topic of machinability. You must take into account how the machining process of turning on a lathe actually works. When you are feeding your tool into the workpiece, there is always going to be a non-negligible force required to do so, which is subsequently imparted onto the workpiece. And as the walls of the workpiece get thinner, the deflection will increase as well. And as deflection increases as a function of the wall thickness, the final yo-yo will tend to have more material on it than it was originally designed to have, because the yo-yo will kind of flex out of the way as you plunge the tool into it. What this means is that, in some cases, yo-yos can end up off-spec and unacceptably heavy once they are machined, usually leading to a redesign in order to compensate for this mysteriously additional mass that most designers semi-wrongly attribute to the machinist being of poor quality, which is only partially true as the only way to lessen the impact of this without changing the design is to considerably decrease the depth of cut as well as the overall surface feed rate, which slows the manufacturing of each individual yo-yo half incredibly and is therefore very expensive. And I would like to add that different materials almost always have different machining properties. Consequently, average minimum wall thicknesses for yo-yos of different materials can vary considerably. For example, for titanium, I use a conservative minimum wall thickness of 0.8 millimeters. However, because density of metals and plastics usually accompany a material's strength characteristics, denser materials can usually tolerate thinner walls and vice versa. Part 2. 
Tool geometry is something that nearly every single yo-yo designer I've met doesn't think about, but it really informs more about how subconscious good practices in yo-yo design have become. That being said, there are still many easy mistakes that rookie yo-yo designers frequently make. The main two of such mistakes are failure to consider what I call overhang angles and failure to consider something called minimum fillet radius. Failure to consider what I call an overhang angle is when a yo-yo has either a particularly steep undercut in the cup or a moderately steep undercut at a lower radius in the cup. Both of these create the same problem. The easiest cutting tool your machinist will want to use cannot physically cut that geometry. But although the problems for the two overhangs are the same, they have slightly different solutions. Both problems ultimately stem from the same problem, and that is due to the necessarily bulky nature of cutting tools for heavy-duty industrial manufacturing. There are technically an infinite number of cutting tools for turning operations, as custom tooling is frequently required for lower throughput manufacturing methods. However, yo-yos designed for perfectly optimal manufacturing are usually manufactured using eight specific operations, although they historically used more than eight. These eight operations are drilling or boring, face grooving, undercutting, inner diameter finishing, undercut finishing, outer diameter rough cutting, outer diameter finishing, and the part off tool. The problem arises going back to our previous bad design in the undercutting operation and the face grooving operation, as the tool which is usually used to cut the undercuts usually looks a little bit like this. See the problem? It can't reach inward far enough. And while it is possible to either get custom made tools which can reach that deep, or use specifically purchased tools to cut that specific geometry, all of a sudden the requirements for what tools can cut what shapes get far more complicated. The other solution that can be done either with a more sophisticated machine or with a secondary machining operation is to feed with the compound rest in at a specific angle with a more simple tool in order to achieve the geometry that you want. The problem with this approach is that at a certain angle, it becomes impossible to fit the tool into the undercut, as it would collide with the rest of the yo-yo that you usually don't even bother thinking about, and it would require a whole additional degree of freedom of the CNC machine, which starts to become unfeasibly expensive. The takeaway here is that although even the craziest yo-yo designs you can possibly imagine are technically machinable, because at this point, nearly everything imaginable is technically machinable, you would only be purchasing no useful performance attributes of your yo-yo while simultaneously purchasing the scorn of whatever machinist you ask to make a thousand of your ridiculous design, for a price which they will usually set astonishingly high, usually in an effort to passive-aggressively get you to take your inconsiderate design somewhere else. That was consideration for overhang angles. Now on to minimum fillet radius. For nearly any concave turning operation involved in turning your yo-yo, you will want to avoid leaving two non-tangent arcs or lines coincident with one another, as this leads to the classical problem of what I like to think of as sharpness. If you design an object, say a yo-yo, which has an infinitely sharp corner cut into it like you see here, you need to ask yourself, what kind of tool can possibly cut that? Is it possible to make an infinitely sharp cutting tool? No. So therefore you cannot possibly cut that. Instead, what will happen is, at a tens of micron scale, the radius of your cutting tool in question's cutting tip will be the actual radius of what is effectively a fillet at your point of coincidence. This is usually fine, as certain computer-aided manufacturing software, the software that takes your design and turns it into a series of commands which tell the lathe what to do, can interpret a design that is technically impossible and kind of round it out. But in my opinion, Anytime you are trusting a software to understand your intentions for you, you would be better off making your intentions more clear. In order to avoid this problem, you must instead put a fillet in between the two lines. If you wish to be conservative and assume that the shop you have manufacturing your yo-yo does not have many custom tools for this type of high precision turning, utilize a minimum fillet radius of 1.1 millimeters. If you believe your manufacturer is either particularly well equipped or is willing to invest in some more custom tooling for your yo-yo design, you can either use a 0.41 millimeter minimum fillet radius or a 0.21 millimeter minimum fillet radius. If you can, ask your machine shop before you design such small fillets what the radius of their smallest carbide insert is. On the topic of speaking to your machine shop and getting information to your manufacturer, it's time to talk about CAD software, CAM software, file formats, and best practices. A commonly asked question in the designer community is, what software do you use to design yo-yos? 
And the answer to this question is that I use SolidWorks, an extremely powerful, highly modern, relatively expensive software. I do not expect even the plurality of those who wish to design their own yo-yos to use a software like SolidWorks. To the best of my knowledge, there is too large a number of free, cheap, or otherwise gray area CAD software out there for me to even try to make a list. And to avoid specific advocacy, I'll leave it to the commenters down below to say what their personal preference of software is in order to let democracy do a better job of this than I can. And to assure that I don't say a specific free software that happens to go out of business long after I post this video. Instead of listing a finite number of CAD softwares you can use to design your yo-yo, I will instead say what criteria your CAD software must meet. The two most commonly used file formats for sending yo-yo designs to manufacturers are the DXF file format and the DWG file format. Worthy of note is that these two file formats are 2D formats, not 3D formats. So if you design your yo-yo in a 2D software and use various forms of CAD magic to determine its mass properties, that is all well and good. However, if you choose to use 3D CAD software, know that you cannot simply create your 3D model, go to export or save as, and select your file format as DXF or DWG. Do not do this. A solid 70% of all my clients who have tried to give me initial CAD models to work off of have done this, and they do not understand the folly of their actions. If you do this, the machinist in question will open up a file that looks like this, when, in order to do their job properly, they need a file that looks like this. If you do it the other way, that's not okay. Then how can you get your DXF or DWG in a proper way if you make your yo-yos in a 3D software? Excellent question. My favorite way of doing it that I know with certainty works in at least three different softwares I've used is to cut away three quarters of your yo-yo half once it is completely catted and then making a DXF or DWG based upon the face of the yo-yo that remains. Alternatively, you can simply delete whatever feature it was that you used to turn your 2D sketch into a 3D revolve if you are using a fully parametric CAD software and save that sketch in question as a DXF or DWG. A common problem that people can sometimes experience is that of saving your DXF or DWG, and then you would perhaps try to open it up in a different software and then either see that your yo-yo would be the size of a grain of rice or the size of a full-sized beach ball. What tends to happen sometimes is that you may have catted your yo-yo in a workspace that was not set to the right settings. It may have been set to metric settings but did not change your base software unit system, so it happened to save into imperial units instead of metric units, meaning that it would think that every one millimeter was actually one inch, so your yo-yo would be 25.4 times too large or 25.4 times too small if your settings were inverted from how I said they were make sure you double check your units when you create your DXF or DWG. It's time to talk about splines. A spline in engineering design refers to a shape that was traditionally created by bending a flexible ruler into an arbitrary curve in order to obtain a specific geometry. Many artists and engineers CAD with splines because they are sometimes easier to just drag into a shape that looks like what you want it to look like. However, because these splines are usually quite difficult to define with math and numbers, they open the door for possible misunderstandings when trying to incorporate them into certain CAM software. The easiest way to assure that this misunderstanding doesn't happen is to just not use splines. Use exclusively circular arcs and straight lines instead. I do this for about 98% of yo-yos that I design. If you choose to use splines anyway, make sure that your machinist is okay with you using splines. If your machinist says no to you using splines and doesn't want you to use splines, but you want to use them anyway because you don't want to listen to either me or them, make sure your CAD software is exporting splines as polylines. And with that, I have covered everything I believe you need to know about how to design your modern yo-yo within known design limits and how to design your yo-yo to be easily manufactured. This concludes what I believe to be the core content of Yo-Yo Design 101. If you have any additional questions that you believe may warrant more videos explaining, such as how to design specific types of yo-yos, let me know in the comments down below. I'm Zach, and it has been an honor to teach you all what I know about yo-yo design. Thank you, and good luck.